Good evening. Oh, what a good group. I'm Loa Traxler. I'm the Associate Deputy Director here at the Penn Museum. And I'm also curator of the Maya 2012 exhibition. And it is a real pleasure to see you all here this evening. We have an amazing swirl of events going on at the museum this evening. So I'm delighted to welcome you here. And it is a genuine pleasure, in fact, this evening to welcome our speaker, uh, Professor Anthony Avini. He is the Russell Colgate Distinguished University Professor of Astronomy, Anthropology, and Native American Studies. He holds appointments in the departments of Physics and Astronomy, as well as the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Colgate University, where, by my calculations, he has taught for almost 50 years. Very exciting. Accolades over many years for Professor Avini include being named to Rolling Stone's uh, list of 10 best university professors, as well as the much more buttoned down group of the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education, who named Professor Avini Professor of the Year um, several years ago. Um, and that is the highest teaching award that we give nationally. Dr. Avini helped develop the field of cultural astronomy and is in fact considered one of the founders of archaeoastronomy, in particular for his research with the peoples of Mesoamerica, uh, working among the ruins of the Aztec and the Maya civilizations in particular. Dr. Avini is author of over 16 books and has edited another 13. And his most recent book, uh, well, I assume it's still your most recent book, um, the End of Time, The Maya Mystery of 2012 is in fact, I believe now, out of print, but we have obtained copies here, and Professor Avini has kindly agreed to sign copies that will be for sale in the Mosaic Gallery after his lecture. Um, and in fact, this book was um, so influential for our exhibition project upstairs that he kindly agreed to serve as an advisor to us for the Maya 2012 exhibition. And I happily point out that this book title will hit every Google search that you can imagine. So um, it should be quite easy to find um, if you, and you can take home a copy this evening. For those who may not have had a chance yet to see the exhibition, after Dr. Avini's presentation and after you pick up a copy of his book, if you are so moved. You may also go upstairs and go to the exhibition for a special discounted price. So um, talk to the folks at the entry desk outside the gallery space, and they would be delighted to welcome you to the exhibition this evening while you're here. Without further ado, let me welcome Tony Avini to the stand, and he's to share his thoughts this evening on the upcoming event and how we should prepare ourselves. Please welcome Anthony Avini. Thank you, Loa, and I would ask the audience members and um, guests who've seen the show to join me in congratulating, congratulating Loa and the entire staff of the Penn Museum for presenting an extraordinary uh, Maya exposition. Not just extraordinary, but responsible and thorough exposition of the intellectual achievements of the ancient Maya. Now, unless you've been living under a rock on another planet, you're probably aware that in just nine days, <laughs> that's the solstice, December the 21st, 2012, the longest of all the long count cycles of the ancient Maya, the 5,125 year long cycle, known as the long count will turn over. And I say living under a rock on another planet because there are over a third of a billion Google hits under Maya 2012. Uh, so you have to really be deep buried under that rock unless you're in your bunker. Uh, you, you, you're well aware of what's going to happen. So there are big things uh, in store for us. And so tonight, uh, tonight's talk uh, will be presented in three parts. And in the first part, uh, we'll deal with what, uh, what some people say this is going to mean for us. And then in the second part, we'll talk 
about what this turnover of the calendar may have meant to the ancient Maya. And part two comes with an anthropological and astronomical critique of part one. <laughs> and then in part three, we'll entertain, I think, the most interesting and important question of all, and that is why is it that American pop culture is so cranked up with the idea of the end of the world, which doesn't seem to be such a big deal in France, or in North Korea. <laughs> so to part one. Big happenings in North Korea today. I think they lit off the firecrackers, so we should pay attention to them. Yeah. Now, let's look at the first part, and I'm going to try to distill those third of a billion Google hits down to just a short period of time, because I only have 50 minutes to tell you the whole story. What do some people say this means for us? And it's interesting that it can mean one of two things. We're either in for a big blow up or a big bliss out, one or the other. There's no in between. So let's talk about this blow up for a minute, a big blow up. Uh, and for those of you who aren't able to read this cartoon, I'll read it for you unless you're in the front row. This is a, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons. Here are a couple of Wall Street guys coming around the corner. This is just about the time of the big financial bust a few years ago, and one says to the other, on the other hand, it's not the end of the world. And there, right around the corner, unbeknownst to them, uh, riding out of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I love that cartoon. Either a blow up or a bliss out. The bliss out would consist of a sudden transcendent of human consciousness, sudden transcendence of human con consciousness, we will suddenly be catapulted to a higher level of consciousness when we get beamed up at that instant uh, when the Maya long count turns over. Now, I know you're all busy people, and you don't have time to worry too much about this blow up or bliss out, but I should point out to you that if it is a blow up, there may be events taking place much like what we saw in the grade B movie 2012, starring the non-Academy Award nominee John Cusack. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful effects, terrible story, I editorialize, where we see the aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy wiped, washed up on the lawn of, of the White House, which could have been used during the recent political campaign as a statement that might go either way. The words are important here, and I know you're busy people, so I have to say that you need to consult Jeff Stray's website if you're busy, because Jeff Stray's website, Diagnosis, suggests that that website packs the most interesting, significant parts of the 2012 message into bite-sized packages for busy people on their lunch hours. So go to that site if you want to get a brief capsula encapsulated summary of things. For those of you who are into frightening tactics, read Lawrence Joseph's book, Apocalypse 2012, in which he advertises on the cover and outsells me 100 to 1, that 2012 will be more tumultuous, catastrophic, and rel revelatory than any other year in human history. And then he says, and some of you older folks may want to think about this, it'll make you think twice about your retirement plans. And that means even if you've already retired, think again, think again. <laughs> Supergiant flares will erupt on the sun's surface, propelling an extraordinary abundance of solar particles earthward at the next peak of the solar cycle, says Joseph. The Earth's magnetic field will undergo reversal. There will be a planetary lineup that will uproot mega bursts of imprisoned radiation trapped in the sun for thousands of years which are deadlier than any of the Earth has encountered since Homo sapiens have been around. Or should that be has been around? That's what Joseph says. And he says the title of his book, Apocalypse 2012, was at the insistence of his editor. He didn't want to entitle it that. <laughs> now, for a moment of seriousness, I should ch tell you that there are many people who do take this message with great seriousness. And if you go to NASA's website, The Astronomer's Questions, you'll hear stories such as I've heard in direct phone calls and emails from people who talk about committing suicide. In fact, I got interested in this project about five years ago when a young Canadian high school student, uh, Dylan O'Quan, emailed me and said that he and his friends were quite concerned about the, at the end of the world. What should they do? Uh, and after I realized they weren't having me on, uh, we, we dialogued back and forth. And uh, uh, Dylan convinced me. He said, you know, you, you know astronomy and you know something about the Maya. You should write about this because nobody is talking about what the Maya really say from what we gather. They're only scaring us to death. 
and so I wrote the book and I dedicated it to young Dylan, who's now aged a few years and is now at the University of Toronto, studying acting of all things. So uh, and maybe he'll star in the next 2012 movie. Uh, but uh, my, uh, our daughter-in-law uh, called us up not more than a few weeks ago and said that her best friend's 15-year-old uh, daughter and her friends were contemplating suicide. So although I speak tongue-in-cheek, uh, and the book is a bit tongue-in-cheek, uh, we're dealing with a subject that people take very, very seriously, and you may have one in your family. Uh, and if that person is here tonight, I'd be happy to talk to him or her and suggest that maybe something else might happen. By the way, there's a solar flare, in case you uh, are wondering about the awesome power of some of these things that we're talking about. A solar flare admits more energy in one second than the entire nuclear arsenal on the surface of the Earth. So that's a lot of energy. And if that were to all come out of the sun all at once in an instant, it might be something to worry about. But as we'll see shortly, there may be an explanation for that. So it can be a horrific subject for people who take this with great seriousness. On the other hand, there are an equal number of people on the blogs and on the Google, uh, uh, on the internet, who suggest that the Earth will not undergo this great apocalyptic ending, but rather we will be blissed out. That is, we will be transported to a new level of consciousness if we're in the right place at the right time. And among those people are one Dr. Carl Johann Kalman, whose book, The Maya Calendar and the Transformation of Consciousness, suggests just this. Um, how to prepare for the event? Kalman says, cleanse the colon with bentonite clay, the better to receive the pranic energy. So Dr. Kalman rides the wave of colonics, which are very, very in in our culture. I think they've replaced aromatherapy. Here you have a couple of book titles that suggest what might happen. And the one on the left, written by John Major Jenkins, who's authored many more books than I have on 2012. Uh, you can see that an alignment with the center of the galaxy is going to take place. Uh, that's going to block out a black hole that has been saving us all this time from any kind of change in the culture. He says it's all told in the sculpture and architecture and hieroglyphs of the ruins of Itzapa in southern Mexico, which is not a Maya site and which has no hieroglyphs. But they were the ones, contends <laughs> Jenkins, who invented the Maya calendar. And they foresaw this date, he says, the Maya foresaw this date at the end of the world. And Jenkins was a follower of one Jose Arguelles, who many of you older folks who were around in 1987 will remember was the father of the great cosmic convergence of a cycle in the Aztec calendar that would cause people to go to important places in the world to acquire the energy that was going to happen, which didn't happen on August the 16th, 1987. So there are many, many books here, and the words are important. And I put the words on the screen because people can be very impressed and very influenced by the printed word. Arguella says, it'll be the most opportune time to reconnect with the upgrading of the light life radiogenetic process at the acupuncture point, that is, the all planetary light body bridge points in the body of Mother Earth. And when I gave this lecture in another venue, some young man came down to me at the end of the lecture and said, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? <laughs> the Maya believed, says Jenkins, that the galactic alignments are involved in a potential awakening experienced by human consciousness. So you can catch the drift of some of these messages. Daniel Pitchbeck, who uses LSD to enhance his views of the Maya world, says there are secret thoughts on suppressed dimensions embedded in Maya 2012 philosophy that can save the world from impending environmental disaster. Daniel swears by lysergic acid, and when I made the mistake of debating him on Montel, I never debate anybody on Montel because Montel does 90% of the talking, I got 2%, and I think Pinchbeck got the other 8%, but he said to me, now, Avini, I don't care uh, how much you uh, know about the Maya and how long you've studied Maya math mathematics, until you've tripped, uh, until you've tripped on LSD in the jungle, you don't know anything. And I wonder what's in Daniel's cereal. I don't know what that's Daniel. I don't know what's in his cereal. I think it's some artificial sweetener. OK, so you get the message, blow up, blitz up. Wouldn't it be interesting to know what the Maya had to say about this? And I think that's the purpose of the whole exhibition. So if you haven't seen it, you better walk through it slowly, because there's some evidence. Uh, if we bother to look at evidence, there is some evidence about what the Maya thought. 
and, and I won't try to paraphrase who the Maya were, I'll let you go through the museum and see for yourself, but we can say, as I show you this view of Tikal, that here were people who between the second and ninth century AD, uh, the cultural heyday of the Maya built great buildings, great architecture, great art, they had writing, one of the few, count them on one, maybe two hands, writing systems in the world, now mostly deciphered. They had a system of mathematics that used a zero in place notation, which the Romans didn't have. Try multiplying x, v, i, i, x by i, l, v, and you'll see that this is a little bit difficult. The Maya were able to do this. Uh, and furthermore, uh, they uh, were given the title classic by we Western historians classic. That means we would dare compare them with the classical world of Greek, Greece and Rome. We don't use that word classic too lightly. We don't use that word too lightly. Uh, I think there are some golf tournaments that are classic, and there was a brand of Coca-Cola that didn't work that was classic. But classic is a very big word. What's the evidence? What's the evidence? Part two. The evidence comes from two sources primarily. The monuments carved in stone, such as you see on the left, one of the stele from the ruins of Copan. Uh, we know of some 500 of those that have been more or less deciphered, pretty much 80% deciphered, still some trouble with the verbs. Uh, and then we have the books, and there are not many of those, such as you see on the right, a page from one of the codices. Uh, only three of those books, I could, I could pile that entire corpus of books on this uh, table right here, uh, and that would be the whole library of the mind. What happened to the books? We know there must have been many because in the recent excavations of the ruins of Sholtun, you're probably aware that there were some numbers that were found that are exactly like the numbers in the codices. That's another talk. Uh, but these numbers were probably being written by characters uh, who were uh, what I call uh, astronomy and math geeks who were working on these codices and writing all of these codices. I wouldn't be surprised if there were rooms full of codices during the classic Maya period. But only three, because when the Spanish came here to Catholicize the Indians, Bishop Landa tells us we found among these people a number of books which were written with their characters, but as they contained little more than the lies of the devil, we burned them all, which they regretted most deeply. Uh, so the books were largely destroyed, uh, but we'll look at the evidence, the monuments first. And here we have uh, a close-up of one of these stele showing what used to be thought on the left to be a god, but now we know very well to have been a real person, a ruler. We know the steles have to do with dynastic history. There's little doubt about that. Here you see this particular king, Maya king of Copan, uh, totally endowed in his getup. Uh, it's, it's not like Roman or Greek art where you show the veins of the body and the curvature of the breast. In the Maya world, it's more about what you wear than how you look, and I doubt that this king would weigh more than 90 pounds uh, stark naked, and it wouldn't make a very good portrait. He is loaded with stuff. He's loaded down. He's got a wonderful turban on. His ancestors are portrayed up in his hat. He carries a double ceremonial bar, the bar ceremonial bar of his office, the sky serpent, the two-headed sky serpent. And he holsters not a pair of six guns, but a pair of stingray spines, which he will use to prick his member to let blood to the gods to bond him to his ancestors who are the gods. When I say prick his member, I don't mean what you see on History Channel, which is the opening of the chest and blood a la Apocalypso gushing all over the Maya altar. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. But the importance of the blood sacrifice to let the blood on parchment, to burn the parchment paper, to allow the smoke to go up to the gods, seals the connection between the dynast between the ruler and between the ancestors in heaven. That's what a blood sacrifice is. It's not anything to get too uptight about. Uh, now, on the side of the monument, we get the information about this date. And, and this is the date of the dedication of the monument. Here you see it in Maya writing, the dot and bar notation, wherein a dot is a one and a bar is a five. Makes sense if you used to count on your fingers before you learned how to put it on parchment, because the point of a finger is a one, two, three, four, five, and when you complete the five, the bar, the completed hand is a five. So I have little doubt that the bar is intended to represent the hand, and the point of the finger is represented by the dot. And so we have a number five, and four dots, or a nine, and the numbers run down in units of 20, starting at the bottom, the number of days, then the number of months of 20 days, then the number of years, 
then the number of scores of years, those are the cartoons, uh, and then the number of scores of scores of years, four score and seven years ago, right? 20. Why 20? The Maya used the base 20 system, probably because they counted on the fingers and the toes, which we wouldn't do because we wear shoes. <laughs> the tropics, it makes sense to count on the fingers and the toes. And so you have uh, nine scores of scores of years. Now, if you do the math, a score is 20, and a score of scores is 20 times 20, it's 400, and nine of those 3,600 years. So we're talking about a date here that goes back from a zero point of the 11th of August, 3,114 BC, a date that was pre-selected, probably having nothing to do with astronomy. There's nothing I can find. It doesn't mean that it didn't have to do with it, but I can't find anything that had to do with it. But anyway, you have, what you have here is nine of these scores of scores, 15 scores, and three zeros. And the three zeros indicate that, well, the odometer turns over, but it's only the last three places when they built this stone to commemorate the event, whatever the event was. We'll tell you what it was in a minute. So it's a 20-year monument. Basically, it's a score of years. Every 20 years, uh, they might put up a monument to say, and what they end up saying is that this king owns this, this score of years. It is as if to say Reagan was the person who ruled in the 80s. Clinton was the person who ruled in the 90s, something like that. We used decades, they used uh, these cartoons. And the translation, as best we can manage it, you can read it for yourself, that it was this day, and I won't read the whole thing because the date is very, very long. They put in other, uh, other cycles and so on. And I often think the Maya must have been terrible businessmen because how would you write out a check uh, if you had to put the phase of the moon and the position of Venus and where Jupiter, forget about it. You know, I'm just going to not write checks. So they couldn't have had, uh, my hypothesis of mine did not have checking accounts. It would not have worked for them. But anyway, on that day, was the image of Macaw Mountain Lord erected? There were completed 15 cartoons, 9, 15, 0, 0, 0. They completed the, that round of cartoons. When he let blood in the image of a god, this, the 13th ruler of the dynasty of Kokan, Mr. Washakla Hunubakawil, whom I think we like to refer to as the Ramses II of Copan, because practically all of the monuments there are dedicated to this guy, who must have done some kind of destalinization program on his predecessors, because he's the guy that's there, and his monuments are all a very important person. Is anything other than this backward-looking history referred to, this idea of uh, uh, ranking yourself according to your ancestors and where you stand in ancestral time, because everything seems to point backward. It's all directed to the past. Uh, well, there are some monuments that refer to the very zero date, the actual beginning, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what they say. And what they say, and I'll only paraphrase here roughly because, the, because it's, it's not completely worked out, but it was this day, zero, 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 it was 13, zero, 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 when the three stones were set, that is to say, the, uh, the uh, cosmic hearthstone, the creation hearthstone, the hearthstones of creation were set uh, at this particular place, which is Kiribwa near Copan. Naturally, that's where the gods created it. And if you live in Philadelphia, you're going to see the gods created the world of Philadelphia. They started in Philadelphia. And then later, there was Jerusalem. Oh, yeah, and there, was, uh, there were other places in the world, and Mecca, but of course, Philadelphia is the center of the world. We know because we live here. And that's what everybody is inclined to say. We're the special people who live in the center of the world. Uh, this three-stone heart is very interesting because if you go into a Maya hut, you'll always see the heart where the fire is and the kettle is always consists almost always of three large stones, three boulders that are set in, a, in an equilateral triangle. And it's inside these three boulders that you build the heart. So the heart is the home. The heart is the world. And the three-stone heart was set here. Nothing here about the beginning of the world, the end of the world, cosmic disaster. Same goes with Tornaguero Monument 6 where you have another reference to the turnover date, but this time it's the 2012 date. There are only two steely, maybe three, that refer to this next date. If it was such a big deal, why are there three? And what does the statement say? Well, the part of it is eroded here, but it does say again about the three stone heart, and those who have interpreted this in great detail tell us that it's only a contextual statement that this particular building in which the monument is housed was renovated or was done over in this epoch, in this epoch. It's as if one wants to say that there was a great Maya exhibit, the best one in the world, and it happened in, in the first years of the third millennium. It only puts it in the context of the third millennium. So 
not any big deal in the monuments. No evidence that there's going to be any cosmic disaster or beaming up or beaming down or anything else from the some 500 monuments that have been discovered. What about the books? Well, the books, such as you see here, a page from the Madrid Codex, so-called because it turned up in the library of the city of Madrid, probably uh, spirited, having been spirited there by some conquistador, I theorize, uh, during the book burning. Uh, maybe he grabbed it and stuffed it in his boot. I'm, I'm making a movie here now. Get, get Brad Pitt involved as one of the conquistadors. Be a good movie. Stuffed it in his boot, took it over there, contraband, sold it, and so on. Ends up in a janitor's trash heap in, in the Madrid library where it's rescued in the 19th century. Good story. Who would you get to be the person who plays the part of the guy that rescues it from the trash heap? Think about it. Uh, and, and, but what are the books about? Basically, they are about religion. If the monuments are about politics and dynastic history, the books are about religion. And every page of the book tells when you offer something, what that something is, to what deity at what time. And so here you see someone offering a deer. Here is someone doing something else. Here, there are some deities drilling fire because there's going to be a new fire ceremony, the overturning of the smaller cycle. There isn't a fragment in there that might have anything to do with the end of the world except for the last page of the Dresden Codex, which you see here. Much has been made about this, and I have to talk about it, and I do talk about it in the book, because it was called by many scholars uh, the end of the world. Surely this is the end of the world. What do we have here that's the end of the world? Well, you have the famous sky serpent, the same one that's on the band that's worn uh, by uh, the king of Copan. It's a segmented sky serpent overhead. He is uh, vomiting huge streams of water on the earth. Here is water flowing from cliffs at the top of the sky. Here is an aged female deity pouring a jug of water. Here is a warrior with blue decorations throwing spears of water. At least that's what the gloss says. Uh, and so this is one hell of a rainstorm. And I think nothing more than that. Uh, I think uh, we're not talking about the end of the world, but rather some terrible disaster that took place, maybe a hurricane. Uh, and if you want to know about ends of the world and end of the world stories, you could either go to Staten Island last month, or you could go to the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans a few years ago, and you would hear about destruction that could create, end up with the creation of some kind of artwork such as this. This is not to suggest that the Maya are predicting the end of the world, but I think more likely that there was some disastrous weather phenomenon, meteorological event, as the meteorologists like to say, that took place uh, in, in that time. And it makes sense because this is the tropics. Now, I want to just look a little bit at this astronomical stuff because this is what scares most people, the sunspots, the overturning of the magnetic field, the flares, and so on. And it is true that 2012 is an active year. And here we're looking at the sunspot numbers, uh, which uh, are an indication how many sunspots you get on the surface of the sun. And that goes through an 11-year cycle. We know it goes through a maximum minimum every 11 years. Yes, 2012, early 2013, is the peak of the cycle. As you can see, if you can see the far right on the screen, we are peaking. But the peak is not going to be much higher than right about where I'm holding my pointer maybe right about there, nowhere near as big as it was in 69 or 1980 when there were many, many more flares. So yes, there is more activity on the surface of the sun. You may have noticed some problems with your GPS, but nothing extraordinary, nothing whatsoever extraordinary as far as we know from observing the sun. Now, I always have to say, as a scientist, I wouldn't be credible at all if I said I was certain about anything. I'm not certain about anything, but I'm willing to put my nickel down against the sunspots overwhelming us, and the sunspots go with the flares. But about the magnetic field reversing, I think I get more, uh, more comments as an astronomer about that event than anything else. Good grief, the magnetic field of the Earth will reverse. What will happen to us? Well, I got news for you. It is reversing. The magnetic field of the Earth is reversing. The poles are moving. But what many of the Y-12 pundits on the internet don't tell you is that it takes 3,000 years for the field to overturn. It's been overturning for 100 or 200 years. It'll be overturning for the next several hundred, even thousands of years. It's a slow process. Nonetheless, should you worry about it? Well, consider what will happen. The magnetic field will break up into several different dipolar fields. That'll raise hell with navigation problems. And you know, again, your 
you're going to be punching in the address of where you want to go in your car, and it's maybe not going to take you there. Uh, but it is not going to produce anything of any disastrous consequence. That we know of. That we know of. And the planetary lineup. Well, if you look at this diagram, which we programmed for you for the night nine days hence, and you can look at that, and there's the Earth, and you might say, well, hold on a minute. There is a lineup. Look at Saturn and look at Jupiter. There is a planetary lineup. What's going to happen? Will the forces of Jupiter and Saturn, like the tides, pull on the Earth? Will they rend it apart? Will they shatter the Earth? Will they cause the San Andreas Fault to separate? Well, here you could do a calculation. And you don't see too many of these calculations done on the internet. Well, I think they'd be damned impressive if they were. What forces raise tides on Earth? Well, the moon does. I think most people know that. Number two is the sun. And when the sun and the moon line up, you get extreme tides. The moon produces a two-foot tide, and the sun produces a one-foot tide. So when you get a full moon or a new moon, sun and moon line up with the Earth, you get a two plus one, which is a three-foot tide. And when they oppose each other, you get first to last quarter moon, you get a two minus one or a one-foot tide. What's the third strongest tide-raising object? It's not Jupiter. It's not Saturn. It turns out to be Venus because it's close to us. And do you know how big the force of the tide is produced by Venus on the Earth? One five hundredth of an inch. So if you get the Earth and the Sun and the Moon lining up, you will get a two plus one plus one five hundredth of an inch tide. And I don't think that's enough force to cause any terrible havoc to take place on or in the Earth. In fact, I think the people sitting in the front row have a better chance of toppling the tallest build, building in Philadelphia if they all push together, <laughs> then does an alignment of rending the earth apart. And I see there's some pretty hefty guys in the front row, and a hefty girls, too. So that's what we're going to do after the lecture. We're all going to go down to the, now, never mind, we won't do that. OK, so I'm trying to alleviate some fears, and I'm not making this up. It is based on what we call evidence, reasoned evidence, if you opt for that explanation. But nonetheless, uh, we still have the bliss up to deal with. And John Major Jenkins says that when the solstice sun passes the galactic plane, we will reconnect with our cosmic heart. So now we have to know not so much what a cosmic heart is, we don't know what that is, but we have to know what we mean by this galactic plane. So a quick review of astronomy, for those of you who may not be acquainted, we live in a large, thin, uh, kind of pod disk shape, like two saucers held together. Uh, uh, aggregate of stuff made up of interstellar matter and about 250 billion stars that we call the Milky Way galaxy. Fortunately, we live in suburbia. We're not in the middle of the urban zone where there are all kinds of supernovas popping off, so we wouldn't be in, around very long if we live there. But we live out in the suburban zone, surrounded by the dark, murky gap. And when we look around in the plane of the galaxy for 360 degrees, this is what we see. This was not known to Western culture until the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, realized that, well, that's what we're living in, this, this Milky Way galaxy. This is what you see when you're on the inside. It's like the forest and the trees. You know, it's easy to see from the outside. And by the way, somebody did ask me at another lecture that, is that really a picture of the galaxy seen from the outside? No, that's another galaxy. So we live in a galaxy like that, so I have to clarify that. If you should want to not get in contact with a um, And so here is the dark murky gap where all the stars form. And to get the real effect in this picture, you have to kind of cut it out and paste it around your head, because it goes through 360 degrees. And that's how you see it from the surface of the Earth. That's the surface of the Earth. That's the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. Go out on any clear night, not in the city of Philadelphia, I mean, where there are no lights, and you'll be treated to one of the most wondrous views of one of the great natural phenomena you can ever hope to see. And that's this wonderful Milky Way, especially in the summertime. And it goes all the way around the sky. And so uh, what about this business of the sun passing through the center of the Milky Way galaxy on the 21st of December? What, what does that mean, passing through the center of the galaxy? Well, here I have to give you a brief explanation of a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. And everybody start going to sleep, because this is science. But it won't be long, I promise you. It turns out that the Earth spins on its axis like a top. Never mind about what causes that. It's the sun and the moon. Ask me later. We're not doing physics. But it spins like a top. And it takes 26,000 years for the Earth to make one spin. 
And what that really means is that over the long run, all the coordinates of the stars change. I mean, imagine Philadelphia being in the tropics. That's going to happen because the coordinates will change. But here the coordinates of the stars change, which means we get new pole stars and we get new uh, constellations in different planes. And so here you just see that the pole star changes and the sun marches along the zodiac from sign to sign, right? What's your sign? Everybody knows your sign. I'm a Pisces. I'm a Pisces, born in March. But if I lived 5,000 years ago, I'd have been a Taurus. Get it? Because the sun on any given day, that means your birthday, or as shown here, the equinox, which happens to be in my month, the sun on every, any given day slowly moves through the zodiac. Uh, and so here I'm showing you where the equinox sun was at different times in history. And why I show the equinox sun? Because all the calendars, the Hebrew calendar, uh, the Roman calendar, all pretty much start on the equinox. So here you see that in 5,000 years ago, 3,000 BC, the sun on the equinox was located between the horns of Taurus. And that's why many people say, when you look at Egyptian and even Minoan iconography, you often see the disk of the sun between the horns of the bull. I'm not making a sign at you. Between the, I'm the bull and the disk is between my horns. Get it? And, and you see that. And there are people who believe that when the sun moves from one constellation to another and the signs change, that also means that the future of humanity changes. That also means that the ages of humanity are fixed in the stars. This is a, a commonly held belief called the theory of world ages. And it's very much tied to some of the mythology of 2012, which I'm mentioning yet. You move slowly from one constellation to the other, and the world changes. So the age of Egypt was followed by the age of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, when the equinox sun moved into Aries. And that was followed, they say, by the age of Christ, when the sun moved into Pisces. And those of you who know Christian iconography are aware of the association between the fishes and Christ. Very common theory. It actually goes back even to, to St. Augustine, who, who proffered that theory, that there are these changes that happen every couple of thousand years when the sun marches from one constellation of the zodiac to another. And the math is simple here. There are 12 constellations of the zodiac, 26,000 years for the access to, access to gyrate. So 12 goes into 26, about 2,000 years and change. So could it be? that our future is determined by the stars. Our destiny is fixed in the stars. This is what people who proffer the world age theory believe. You're all aware of what the next age will be. You can see it on the screen. After the age of Pisces comes, an age depicted in a, an old 60s Broadway musical. And I know you hippies are out there, because I've caught some of you. You're out there. You're still hippies in your soul. Don't, don't lie to me. Uh, recently revivified on Broadway and made famous by a famous group that had one more dimension than Einstein. I'm not going to tell you who they are. It's the age of Aquarius. Uh, and of course, the age of Aquarius uh, is when we're going to get this new revelation that's going to happen. We're going to get beamed up. We're going to get beamed up. Now, when does that age occur? I remember assigning that, that assignment to my 69 and 70 hippie students because they I wanted to get them to learn some astronomy. Well, let's calculate when the age of Aquarius will happen. And the answer is, you can see on the screen, 2,730 AD. And my students were so bummed when they learned. <laughs> they, weren't gonna, they weren't gonna be here to witness the coming of the age of Aquarius. Well, this is time, I think, now for audience participation, because we're getting into the, the long and the tooth part of this lecture. And so I want to show you uh, how this sun migrates. And so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna animate this. And Here's the sun uh, moving on December 21st. Here's the galaxy. There's the center of the galaxy. Down here are the years. In the lower right, I think the podium may block it. You're seeing the Earth gyrating. There it goes through the center of the galaxy. Get it? That's the center of the galaxy. Now what I'm going to do is to see if you can tell me when you think I should stop the animation. And let's see if you people in Philadelphia can beat out those snobs in Cambridge last week that I had to show this animation. See if you, if Penn could beat Harvard in a little post-final Ivy League uh, contest. If you can stop, tell me when to stop when the sun reaches that galactic plane and reconnect with our cosmic heart. You say so. And I'm gonna do it slowly. See the date, 3628 BC and marching, 2878. 
2378. You say when to stop. Here comes the plane of the galaxy. We want to get it right in the middle. We want to nail it. December the 21st, 2012. We're down to the age of Caesar. Now we're in the dark ages. Look, it's getting closer and closer. Good. Pretty good. I think you did beat. You did beat out Harvard. You got, let me tell you the results. Harvard got 1776, and you got 1872. So you're closer. <laughs> you were only off by a mere 150 years. But do I make my point here? Do I make my point? The sun has been going through the center of the galaxy for hundreds of years and will continue to do so. And to say that it reaches the center of the galaxy nine days from now, is a little bit like saying that it's noon time any time the little hand is between the 11 and the 1. Between the 11 and the 1. Between the 11 and the 1. If that's good enough for you, we'll meet for lunch at noon, you know, then, then it's OK. Uh, but I think it's interesting how people who do this, these calculations tend to exaggerate the results a little bit. Same goes for the turning over of the magnetic field. These things are all happening. I don't know of any consequence, good or bad connected with the sun passing through the center of the galaxy. But then maybe, I, maybe I'm misled and misguided. Finally, we'll turn to the most interesting question in what little time we have left. And that is, why is this such a big deal in American culture? I gave a talk in Toronto, the Royal Ontario Museum, a few weeks ago. I had a chance to use some Canadian money. It's about one to one. When you look at the back of a Canadian dollar, Canadian five dollar bill, what do you see? There are people ice skating. There's a young couple walking through an archway. There are little kids playing in the snow. What do we see on the back of our dollar bill? <laughs> a weird looking pyramid, a mysterious looking eye, and some writing in Latin, anuit coeptis novus ordo seclorum, to the words of the poet Virgil. Basically, they say he, understood to be he the Lord, approves or smiles upon our new order of the ages our new order of the ages. In other words, it's in America where we will see the new order of the ages. This is about American exclusivity, that the idea that what's really going to happen in the world is going to happen in America. And if you don't believe me, read Columbus's diary, because Columbus says very clearly in his diary in more than one place that I have come to this new world to make ready for the coming to the earth of the city of Zion, the coming to the world of the city of Zion. He's talking about the second coming of Jesus. And he says that that will happen in the New World. And that idea is picked up by the Puritans who settle uh, in uh, New England uh, and uh, who are very much uh, uh, upset with the Anglican Church because they're not allowed to pursue their own religious philosophy, which includes a heavy dose of predicting the end of the world. You read some of these Puritanical uh, philosophers like Cotton Mather and other people. Can't go into detail. Uh, but here you see someone preaching the end of the world, uh, and this is going to happen. And these are these New England preachers. Now, the people who were the creme de la creme of far out religious cults, that is, couldn't even be tolerated in Boston, Hart uh, Hartford, or New Haven, they migrated out the Erie Canal, established 1825, and came to live where I am, though I wasn't there then, in central New York, which is known as the Burned Over District. That's the area of Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo. Uh, and they came out the Erie Canal, and that's where Mormonism started, became a legitimate American religion, Seventh day Adventist. Uh, all kinds of experimental religions, many of them preaching the end of days. And I'm fond of telling my students in my little rural, backward, tiny college in the middle of nowhere where not much happens except that they grow potatoes. And, and that is, I tell them, if you think Hamilton, New York is dull today, you should have been here 160 years ago. And it was, it was humming with activity. <laughs> and among those who were there was a pastor by the name of William Miller who used a biblical code uh, uh, a la Dan Brown, you know, the, the Da Vinci Code, uh, using biblical arithmetic, where you make numerical equations out of letters to calculate the age uh, of the second coming of Christ. And I think you can see from this poster that he used to lecture, if I were one of these characters back in the 1880s and 1850s, uh, we'd all be out in a tent, and I'd be lecturing in a tent with a big chart. There wouldn't be any PowerPoint or slides or anything like that. And you would come from miles around with your horse and buggy and, and, and come in the big tent, and we'd be all under the camping tent and, and hearing the lecture. Uh, and he's showing you here that there's no question that the end of the world would be in 1843. Uh, and that was the time that he set, a uh, date in the summer of 1843, when he says Jesus would come from heaven and lift us, lift us up out of the world. And 
And that's exactly what's being proffered about Quetzalcoatl, uh, and that's why so many people go down to Maya land. It's not about Jesus, it's about the Maya deities who are gonna come and do all of this and take us to this higher plane uh, of existence. Now that didn't happen. Turns out it didn't happen. So uh, the good pastor reset the date to a date in August uh, in 1844. And that didn't happen. That was called the great day of the great disappointment, uh, indeed, because people had sold, many people had sold their goods. He had a lot of followers all over New England, even as far south as Baltimore, far north as Montreal. Uh, and many people uh, were very upset about this, uh, refused to give up their faith. They got into a kind of cognitive, what the psychologists call cognitive dissonance, refused to give this up. Out of it came the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which still proffers an end of days, but doesn't put the date on it. doesn't say we, we, it's going to happen. Jesus will come, but it isn't going to happen on a certain day. I mean, the people have learned, uh, unlike some of the Y-12 prophets, not to set a date. Harold Camping did the same thing a couple of years ago. Set it, reset it, set it a third time. Prediction. The date will be reset if the world does not come to an end. Prediction. <laughs> and you have to be in the right place at the right time. That's why everybody is rushing down now to Mesoamerica because you don't get the energy unless you're in the right place. You've got to be where the, where the uh, heliotropic octaves converge. And so sacred travel is a very big deal. Uh, and there are people going to all sorts of places. My favorite is Chichen Itza, where, of course, if you go on the equinox, you're probably familiar with the seven diamonds of light produced by the shadow of the edge of the pyramid on the balustrade of the pyramid of Kukul Khan, uh, the serpent descending. And you can even see the serpent stone down at the bottom. And uh, Lorraine and I have witnessed this phenomenon many times. I went there originally to see how they managed this with the architecture and how they calculated it. We got so interested in the people uh, who went there, mostly white people, uh, to get saved and to put their hands on the pyramid and to get this knowledge coming from the transcendent beings who now are no longer Christian or any other kinds of deities, but they are Maya deities. Uh, and so here you see a scene, some 60,000 people there, recent years. Here is uh, person holding up a baby, uh, holding the baby up to get the rays of Quetzalcoatl. I made the mistake in one of my passionate moments on a podium a few years ago of saying, I don't know why I put it this way, and I held my hands up like I was talking so much about Pastor Miller. I said, and holding up a naked babe, holding up a naked babe. And at the end of the lecture, a young man came down and said, I didn't see a naked woman in that slide. <laughs> it's a baby. It's a baby, not a baby. So who are these people? Who are these people? No, not these people. That's a picture of what I'll be doing in my retirement. Not drinking tequilas. I'm going to manufacture that machine, get it patented. I'm from a billboard in Ann Arbor. But what do I mean by these people, seriously? The people who proffer these ideas of the bliss out and the blow up. And again, I appeal to the words because they're very important. I think in these quotations that come from various books and websites, you'll get an idea of what these people are thinking. I think they're all well-intentioned people. They're worried people. Uh, the forces of scientific materialism have zealously guarded the portals to their domain. And there's a growing demand for more complete disclosure of solar activity vital to our health. You see, there are people who believe that we are keeping secrets. And I don't mean the government. I mean we scientists. That we know what's going to happen, but we're just not telling. These are the conspiracy theorists in our culture. And maybe some of them have a right to be conspiracy theorists, given what goes on in the world. I like the third dot, and we could probably debate it after the lecture for a long time. Western civilization rules the globe through dominant forms of coercion and control, says John Major Jenkins. And that maybe, maybe that they could be true. I don't know. I won't argue with it. I like the last one. Science is the world's religion, and individual personalities are elevated to godhood. It sure as hell doesn't show up in my salary. I'll tell you that. I don't know if God gets paid by the hour, gets time off in the summer, but I don't make a lot of money doing this, which is why I'm selling my book. And then says uh, uh, um, one of them, whom I've quoted before, uh, Zarek Weyas, and I will have to draw breath to utter this, that 2012 be the most opportune time to reconnect with the heliotropic octaves and the solar activated electromagnetic field that will lead to an upgrading of the light life radiogenetic process. Did you get that? Did you write that down? The words are important because people read the words, and, and I think young people who are easily influenced read these words, and they're very impressed with the scientific jargon. 
if you've got style and you know how to use the jargon, you can sell ice to the Eskimos. I mean, you really can convince people with just the words. I think we have to get better educated about what these words mean. My plea here is for education. So here, I, in summary, uh, 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 something I draw in part from a very a good historian uh, who wrote an interesting book uh, about uh, the end of the world, and not so much the end of the world, but the endings of the world, what he called the fin de siècle feelings, the ideas of what's happened when the cycles overturn. Uh, this is the historian Hillel Schwartz, and it comes from one of his books written in the 1980s about what's going to happen in Y2K. Uh, he had studied uh, the history of what happened in 1199, 1299, 1399, and so on, and he wrote this wonderful book called Century's End about the fin de siècle uh, attitudes and ideas, and he says, always joy despite looming disaster. You can read these. The moment for change is upon us. Um, that's interesting that, that it's been 5,125 years that the Maya calendar is going to overturn. We just happen to be here in the last nine days. How fortunate are we? That'll open the doorway to renewal. This is what my religious historians call the salvative experience that we all need in a world bereft of spirituality and in hard times. We're looking for salvation. That's the doorway to renewal. Polar shift, strange stirrings of delight. The knowledge is always secretly encoded astronomically. That's really what got me interested in from the point of view of astronomy. And then I humbly added my own bullet at the end, having studied all this stuff that he hadn't put in there. This, the knowledge always seems to come now from far away. The farther away, the better. Uh, this is a sign of a culture that lost faith in its own history, in its own background, that we have to look out to the Maya to get the answers. If you were around in 1920, you'd look to the Egyptians, because they just excavated King Tut's tomb. And that's why they looked at the Egyptians. If you were around in the 1880s, you would have looked to the wisdom of the wise men of the East, particularly India, which uh, promulgated the start of the entire theosophical movement, the wisdom of the famous yogi and, and wiz, wise men uh, of India and of the East. Many of that's still with us. Um, now it's the Maya's turn. Why? We decoded the writing in the last couple of generations. Tourism has opened up the Maya world, particularly to Americans who go down there a lot. And of course, the calendar's overturning. The calendar's overturning. But if we're not satisfied with going far enough out to the Maya, we can even appeal to the aliens. And there are many of these websites that connect the Maya with aliens. Uh, and this is a little alien timeline that I copped from Skeptical Inquirer showing the entire panoply of aliens going back to the, oh, going way back to the 1948, you know, that first Roswell event. Uh, I'll take it back even farther. These were aliens in the 19th century, and I think it's kind of fun to look at UFOs and aliens from a different time, uh, alleged to exist on the surface of the moon, having been observed with a telescope, uh, and uh, they are peaceable people. They are living the way we wish we could live and we could learn from them. Here you see uh, a civilization of bat-winged people uh, with mothers nursing their babies, uh, living peaceably alongside a race of Pooh bears who live in huts that look suspiciously like those that early explorers were seeing and finding in Africa. So you see a wonderful projection here of our own uh, ideas on to uh, a, a culture other than our own and, and wishful thinking involved. The whole thing was, of course, a hoax. And then, uh, of course, these aliens, if you're old like me, you remember those awful movies of the 50s. Which, where we thought the animation was so great, always some kind of slime involved, uh, and they were coming. I remember being a kid growing up during the Cold War. Uh, they, these aliens were coming here for lunch, namely us. We were on the menu. And then uh, came E.T., uh, and E.T., of course, was that beneficent alien that existed during a nice, quiet period of uh, our uh, culture. And we were very prosperous. Uh, there was E.T., uh, and then, of course, about the time of the decoding, of DNA and the, and the fixing of the human genome, then they were here to inseminate us. They were here to kidnap us, insert needles, and take our amniotic fluid uh, and, and, and study it so they could create their own kind of human beings. And it's interesting to follow these creatures from far away, even farther away than the Maya. Then there was Contact, a very optimistic movie about what might happen if the aliens were to come here, lift us up out of our misery, and cure us. And the question was asked of the astronomer Frank Drake, who the head of SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, what would you expect if and when we get a contact? What, what will happen? 
And this was his response, and I want you to think about it. Frank Drake said, I fully expect an alien civilization to bequeath us vast, useful libraries of information to do with as we wish. This Encyclopedia Galactica will create the potential for improvements in our lives. Another, even more stirring renaissance will be fueled by the wealth of alien scientific, technological, and social information that awaits us. We may even discover the secret of immortality. So is scientist Drake's response so much different from what we're hearing from those who proffer this uplifting of humanity uh, by some unknown faraway force? Uh, uh, is that really so different? And it seems to me he may be saying the same kind of thing, the same kind of message. So the calendar is overturning. I don't think the Maya had anything to say about the end of the world or even the upgrading of the world either way. They were more concerned with establishing themselves in deep historical time, at least the leaders, the leaders were. And they had a very intricate system of religious worship. Uh, so when that odometer overturns, or overturns, what are you going to do? I know the Penn Museum has some suggestions, and I all come here for the party. Uh, well, what would you do? Uh, well, that question was asked of Alan Christensen, who's a good friend of mine, who's written about the Maya, who works with Maya people. And he, he didn't even ask the question. But when he visited with his shaman, this is a generic shaman, by the way. He's not his shaman. Uh, this is a generic shaman off the internet, because I don't do shamans. Uh, the shaman said, just said to him, uh, when, when, when he saw Christian, says, well, why are you Americans so worked up about this 2012? In fact, he said gringos. Why are you gringos so worked up by 2012? He said, we'll take care of it. We'll take care of it. And what he meant by that is that there'll be another cycle, and we'll do as we've done in previous cycles. Uh, we'll try to make it better, which is what we try to do every New Year's when we make our resolutions. Or at the end of Mardi Gras, if we're good Roman Catholics, uh, where we party like hell in the city of New Orleans. But then at midnight, the police come around, and everything shuts down, and they clean the streets. And the next morning, the good Christian goes to have the ashes daubed on her head uh, or his head. And, and this is nothing more than the ending of a cycle and the beginning of another cycle, which brings with it a spirit, a spirit renewal. And this is pretty much what the Maya are telling us, they think now, and they thought then. So, unless I'm really incorrect about my evidence, uh, this will be what we'll be saying <laughs> on December the 22nd, which I hope will be a happy first day of the rest of your lives. Thank you. is a stupid question. <laughs> my teacher said that in high school. I raised my hand and he said, get out of this room. I don't want to. No, but seriously, if you have any questions or comments, I'd be delighted to respond or entertain them. So who's first? Sir? Uh, well, it depends on which correlation you believe in. It's a silly argument about two or three days that a lot of people get very worked up about. Uh, not much time to go in the evidence, but I'm a 283 person because I think the 584-283 correlation best incorporates the astronomy and the ethno-history, and I stand by it firmly. The 21st. 23rd is for people who believe in the other correlation. And we can discuss that in the bar afterward. It's a boring, <laughs> it's kind of a boring subject. It's, it's, who cares about whether it's Tuesday or Thursday? But I know. But seriously, I think that the best evidence, and here I would recommend Harvey and Victoria's book, uh, Harvey and Victoria Bricker's book, Astronomy and the Maya Codices, where they give a thorough documentation of 584, 283, which equates that. What that is, is by the way, is how you switch from a Christian day to a Maya day. It's like switching from centigrade to Fahrenheit. You know, you got centigrade Fahrenheit. How do you slide the thermometer? Well, you don't slide it by too many degrees. It doesn't matter so much whether it's minus 19 or minus 18. Well, here, it doesn't matter much, unless you're really into the, the intricacies of it. Yeah, question. Well, it certainly was. And of course, that's, that's a, a wonderful topic to get involved in. And I would recommend here David Webster's excellent book, The Maya Collapse. And I think many people here at this museum have done a lot of important work on Copan and the collapse. And I think they pretty much have got that nailed, and it had a lot to do with mismanaging uh, the environment uh, and, and not uh, 
having overpopulation and the inability to have the crops and the agriculture and the fields rotate so that the crops could, uh, could continue to feed a growing population. Now, it may be that a drought accompanied that. It could have been a couple of things adding together. Uh, we don't understand it. I think most experts don't interpret it to be a collapse by the way your tire goes flat, but rather something that took a couple of generations. Uh, but the lessons of history are clear, and I like to tell students who take the courses to study the Maya, very relevant to learn the lessons of history about how another culture may have done things in the environment or may have reacted to things that happened in the environment in different ways that we could learn from if we are interested in learning the lessons of history. In this case, it's somebody else's history. So, good question to ask. Yes. Twenty four hour day and the twenty six thousand year. Yeah, well they're not connected. I mean the twenty four hour day is a period of rotation. That's just the earth spinning on its axis every twenty four hours. Now take the axis. The earth goes around the sun and the axis points in the same direction. So I'm imagining the sun is here and the earth is going around. And it always points to Polaris, the North Star. You know, we can depend on that tomorrow, next week, last week, ten years ago. And you might say, well, wait a minute, if you're moving the Earth like that, how could it always point to the same star? Well, the stars are very far away. So for all practical purposes, that's Polaris, whether I'm in China or whether I'm in Philadelphia. It points in that direction. However, over the long periods of time, that axis gyrates like a top. It wobbles. And that means that it inscribes a line on the sky that passes through Polaris, which is now the pole star, but 5,000 years ago passed through the alpha star in the tail of Draco the dragon, which was the pole star of the time of the pharaohs, and will pass 12,000 years hence close to the star Vega. We'll have a very bright pole star in about 12, 13,000 years. And that scratches out a big circle on the sky, takes 26,000 years to do that, produced by the forces of the sun and the moon, for those who are interested, acting on the Earth's bulge that comes from rotating. The Earth bulges at the equator because it rotates, and the moon and the sun try to take the bulge and put it into the plane of the zodiac. But the Earth doesn't respond that way. Take a, take a, a little gyroscope sometime and try nudging it, and the gyroscope won't fall over. It'll do this. So the Earth is a gyroscope in addition to magnet, magnet. Very interesting. The connection I tried to make there, I didn't make it, but many world age people make it as, aha, 26,000 years, 12 constellations of the zodiac, that's about 2,000 years for every age. And Augustine tells us that these ages change every 2,000 years. It is all written, he says, in the Testaments, that every 2,000 years things change. And that's why Y2K was a big deal. It was 2,000 years after uh, the birth of Christ and 6,000 years after the creation of the world, according to Bishop Usher, 4004 BC, off by four years because Christ was not born and he was born 404, 4, 4 BC, not zero. Another problem, doing footnotes. Um, and so, uh, and there are many people who still believe that. Okay to them, they want to believe it, I have no problem with it. But you see, you go from 4000 BC, 2000 BC, zero, 2000 AD, that's the big happening. The big change. This is a very interesting statement if we look at it from a distance, focus on it from a distance. Humanity's ages are fixed in the stars. It's already fixed. You're, you're, you're destined. It's destiny. And that's a commonly held belief in many world religions. You know, it's already happened. You could read it in your palm, you could read it in your tea leaves. As above, so below is the great motto of world astrology that this is all predetermined. Tough to argue with that. Can't argue with it. I mean, there are people who will believe it, and they, and they may believe it. They're entitled to believe it. But astrology is a powerful force in the world. Two out of three of you believe in it. And you can look at the person to the left, you person to the right, if you're typical. And you say, well, I don't believe it. Then the guy on the left, uh, he does and he does, if you don't. Sorry. That's statistics in action. You raised a question. I gave you more than an answer. Sorry for that. Couldn't, risk go, couldn't resist going there. Other questions? Yes? 
party now. Yeah, one more. We'll do one more. Yeah. No, 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 no. Oh, no. Yes, that's not stupid. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people, <laughs> many of my colleagues say, you know, when you get old, you can't do the math anymore. Then you get into that flaky stuff and just when you get old. <laughs> or, or you get tenure and you can't get fired or something. There may be some truth to that. But, but Jung, of course, is the author or one of the authors of the theory of cosmic archetypes, uh, which is to say that there is embedded in all of us a desire to return to an archaic past uh, which, in which we were all connected. I think the idea draws from Plato's theory of forms, for those who read philosophy, the idea that there is an underlying truth. Uh, uh, Jung, and particularly Merce Eliade, the historian of religion, go, goes further. He claims that primitive people, which he called primitive in the 50s, we now say ancient cultures, were closer to understanding deeper truth because they're not confused and messed up with what he calls the terror of history. In other words, all of these historical events that happen, all of that's meaningless, that's profane. It's sacred time, the deep time, uh, when the truths were known to ancient people in these archetypes that we all share, uh, that that is the real truth. And we all destined, we all want to get back to it. We all want to recover this ancient distant past. It's a philosophy. It's adhered to by many people. And it's an interesting idea. I don't particularly subscribe to it. Uh, but I think it's a kind of a romantic idea, my own feeling. It's a, it's a longing and a wishing, it's a romance. And I think the whole episode of Maya 2012 is a wonderful romance. My view. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming. And uh, Professor Vini will be in the Mosaic Gallery just at the top of the rainy steps, uh, where you may certainly ask any more questions or look and perhaps pick up a copy of his book. And for those that would like to see the Maya exhibition, I invite you to the, to the next floor up above the mosaic um, and to the west end of the building where the exhibit is on display. Thank you so much for coming. And once again, thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thanks.